Hello, I'm Partha Ray, a neurologist, a national professor in neurology in India, and working for the National Health Service in England. I continue on my series of lectures on movement disorders. On this instance, I'll be giving a two-section lecture on atypical Parkinsonian syndromes, a clinical approach. I had the first part where I talked about the neurodegenerative conditions, the four of them. Today, I'll be talking about another series of different conditions that look like Parkinson's disease, but have different other diagnoses. I am a Kolkata medical graduate from 1990. And since 1994, I've initially trained and then practiced neurology and clinical neurophysiology with the National Health Service, England. I would like to pay homage to Dr. Keki Agarwal, who passed away and became a martyr to the COVID earlier on this month at a very young age. He was greatly inspirational and uh, past president of the Indian Medical Association. I also dedicate this lecture to a number of COVID warriors who have laid down their lives in the line of duty and my prayers to the life lost in the COVID times. I have no conflicts of interest or financial disclosures in relation to this particular lecture. In the part one, I did talk about the four neurodegenerative conditions in some detail. Today, I'll be focusing on a wide spectrum of neurological conditions, which are Parkinsonism as a uh, presenting phenomenology, but they have other alternative causes. We'll be talking about vascular Parkinsonism, drug-induced Parkinsonism, some neurodegenerative ones like frontotemporal dementia with Parkinsonism, there's post-encephalitic Parkinsonism, there'll be toxins, and I'll also be talking about genetic causes of Parkinsonism. Now, as always, our patients contribute to our learning. So please, mindful of their confidentiality, privacy, and dignity, refrain from taking any photographs or videos. Although these are from public sources, our responsibility is to our patients to protect their dignity and their privacy. Now, to start off with, what are the disorders that can mimic Parkinson's disease? We have talked about the neurodegenerative ones earlier on, but we have not touched upon Alzheimer's disease, which is the amnestic and the uh, sort of the, in, in, in the parietal temporal lobe syndromes that we have, but they can have an extra pyramidal predominance as well in the way they present. The Huntington disease, particularly when they present early on in life, is entirely extra pyramidal in its presentation. There are some Parkinsonisms which are restricted to certain parts of the world, like the Guam or the Guadeloupe uh, areas. I have spoken about spinal cerebellar ataxias in an earlier talk. The, among the symptomatic ones, there is the drug-induced ones. There are the post-infectious ones. There are metabolic ones like the Wilson's disease, which we have to diagnose and treat. It's treatable. There are neoplastic and perineoplastic causes of Parkinsonian syndromes, post-traumatic encephalopathy, toxic causes, and of course, vascular causes. There are other conditions which can be tremor predominant, often asymmetric in essential tremor, which can look like Parkinson's. There are conditions which have surgical treatments like normal pressure hydrocephalus, which works when we select the patients accurately. And there are neurological sort of uh, niche areas like the SWED, where there are scans without evidence of dopaminergic deficit. We'll talk about them as well. Now, first of all, let's start with the vascular Parkinsonism. Since these diabetes, hypertension, a growing population in age, there'll be a predominance of vascular disease burden in those subjects. And they often present with symptoms of Parkinsonism. It's said to be the second most common cause of Parkinsonism in the movement disorder clinics. Controversy has been around for the last 25 years that I've been in the field about what we see on the scans and whether that's explained the symptoms. Lacuna strokes are said to be more associated with Parkinsonian symptoms. It chiefly affects the lower body, 
with the patients having a broad base that's shuffling with a prominent start and terminal hesitation and freezing. There will be, of course, other evidence of the multi-infarct dementia picture with corticospinal tract involvement of the bladder, falls, and postural instability. Naturally, we're expecting a senior citizen to be affected with often a stepwise uh, progression, but that is often not seen all the times. There will be a poor levodopa response with a pseudobulbar effect and incontinence and pyramidal signs. Structural imaging, MRI and CT scans will show the vascular changes, but the DAT scan is normal. A therapeutic trial of levodopa is often merited in these cases, since there's often a coexistent alpha synuclein pathology. So let's look at this particular short video of a lady with a pathological diagnosis of vascular Parkinsonism, who starts off in this video by showing a severe gait impairment with start hesitation, the characteristic short steps, wide steps, and she relies very much on her walker for ambulation. So please have a look. You watched the turning difficulty that the patient had. And as she was sitting there, there was not much in way of tremors that you could see. Main difficulty in the walking component. She could arise also without too much discomfort. Okay. Moving on to the next video. Let's watch this. There's a background commentary. These videos are from the uh, uh, spring atlas. This gentleman is sitting in a wheelchair. Okay, how long has he been going on? There is um, reasonably normal facial Six expression months. and okay. absence of Describe tremor. Describe to me what, what is actually the problem. Describe it a little bit more in detail. Mm -hmm. Could not start. Could not start. What happened if when you start? If you can't get start, what happens? What happens? If you're able to start, are you able to continue walking? Once I started, I can continue. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Do you have falls? Have you been mm -hmm. falling? One year ago, yes. Okay. Do you fall forward or backward? Forward. Forward. Because I want to jump up. Yeah. And uh, my right hand, my right leg, couldn't. Yeah. Could not climb up. Okay. It's hyperphonic now, twice. Now, the month for me, please, from January. January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September. Okay, can you run back? back He's able to carry out fairly normal, rapid finger tapping movements, open close movements of his hands, supination, pronation movements of his hand on his thigh. With your right hand, can you tap like this for me? Big movement, okay? No bradykinesia. Open and close your hand. No bradykinesia. Okay. Can you do like this? You saw there was no tremors. No, try to. Heel tapping movements are also relatively yeah, brisk bilaterally. Left side seems to be slightly slowed down. That's my judgment. You never have. Are you able to stand up, please, with your arm fold? Yep. He's able to get up from a chair yep. with minimal difficulty with his arms crossed over his chest. Now, when you start. However, his gait is okay. significantly abnormal. This is where the problem is noti noticeable. Stride length is very short, very tentative. Gait is shuffling with reduced elevation of his feet from the floor, and there is also an occasional freezing of gait. So what about if you count one, two, three, start? He stops, okay, cannot so start the movement. One, two, three. He's using an internal metronome to get him to yeah. start to walk. So initiation of gait, mm -hmm. freezing of gait, that's what you see is the problem out here. One, two, three, start. 
He can't initiate the movement. You know? Try to walk. Once you see you walk a little bit more, okay? Try. One, two, three, and and. So. Auditory cue is being used. Watch him when turn. He turn. He hesitates appears to be somewhat stuck to the floor and takes a series of very, very tiny steps to pivot in place. I recommend him that what will be useful for him to have a laser pointer in his hand and, and to point the red laser onto the floor to initiate his gate. That would be a, a good... Patients who have gate initiation yeah, problems will be using a torch or a laser beam to use as a visual cue to get to work, to start to walk. Okay. Now, when you want to start, when you try to point the light onto the floor, I know that this light is not very strong. So, so okay, turn around now. At another time Walk in back. the exam, he actually exhibits a fairly brisk gait until he comes to a stop and attempts to turn. When once again he develops freezing and a series of very small steps. Try again. Keep trying. So there's a fluctuation of his symptoms as you just saw. He suddenly walked very briskly. And all of a sudden he can't, he's just frozen in one place. Now he's using a torch to put a light on the floor over which he will try to step over. And that will help him to get going. In this portion of the clip, he's holding a pen light in his right hand, shining it on the floor and attempting to provide himself with a target that he can step over, which is not particularly helpful. Okay. So so the vascular Parkinsonism predominant gait initiation difficulties and when they start to walk, there is not the normal stride and the step and the cadence that you see and expect to be normal. In a Parkinsonian patient, you will not be seeing this type of gait disorder. Now you'll see some other cues case, being used. Given a target to step over and each Watch. time this is provided, he steps quite nicely and okay. then generates a very brisk gait down the corridor. Once he gets going, it's easy after that point. So I think I've been able to give you some and idea. Step over an obstacle and he's on his way. Of vascular Parkinsonism. Here you'll see the pull test being done on him. Pull testing is done here. wide base being pulled from the back, lack of postural reflex, so he tends to fall backwards on the examiner. The next condition I wish to talk to you about is drug-induced Parkinsonism. You are very well aware of these conditions from referrals made by the psychiatric colleagues and our own use in internal medicine and neurology. There are first generation and second generation antipsychotics. We moved on from the first generation to the second generation antipsychotics because of the specificity of the D2 receptor antagonism of higher potency and then of the lower potency. And you can see the examples of the medicines being laid out there. Then the second generation antipsychotics came, which were the atypicals with uh, dopamine 2 receptor antagonism and partial dopamine 2 receptor agonism. But the problem of uh, extrapyramidal side effects has reduced, although not gone away, as we have moved up the refinement. There is also the anti-emetics and the prokinetic promotility agents, which have affected and caused extrapyramidal syndrome, metoclopramide, tomperidone, Prochlorperazine, levosulpiride, often used as fixed dose combinations, which can give rise to these symptoms. Calcium channel blockers, we have used them in migraines and for vertigo management. Clonorazine, cinerazine can cause drug induced Parkinsonism. In addition, in patients with other movement disorders like chorea and hemibeliscus, we have used dotrobenazine, tetrobenazine valbenazine, and also resorpine. We have used them, and they have also resulted in drug-induced Parkinsonism. 
Moving on from there, let's look at a patient as to the features of drug-induced Parkinson's. Are. Watch the face. Absence of tremors. Rather staring look. Raise that right hand and do that finger tapping again. There is an element of bradykinesia. Now the left one. Asymmetric. Left side is now the right one just not as bad. And the left one. So asymmetric bradykinetic syndrome. Your right toe up and down like you did before. And the other one? It's much better okay. on the left side. Hold your two arms in front of you. Okay. okay. Now, can I have you just uh, stand up for me? And uh, just walk over there. Lack of associated movements. And the worst, One more time. the right side, which is worse, is flexed. One more time, and back again. And have a seat. Right. So that was actually a brief view of drug induced Parkinsonism there, you could see. Let's move on to the next one. So, uh, so the dopamine two blocking drugs uh, cause changes in the indirect pathway of the basal ganglia. And we have talked about the differentiation between the first generation and the second generation, otherwise called as atypical antipsychotics. And you can see the relative affinity for the D2 receptor and the ways they work. Let's not forget valproic acid. Although it's rarely reported, it's quite common in clinical practice on patients who have had valproate for some time. That's in fact a side effect we counsel patients about. Lithium, we've all seen lithium tremors. And SSRIs of these particular groups uh, have all caused tremors. We've talked about the calcium channel blockers and their mode of action as they happen. The drug-induced Parkinsonism can happen like IPD, but the time of onset of the exposure tends to vary. And as we saw in the patient, there was predikinesia, but more importantly was the rigidity. Six months is set to be the time frame of the stopping the offending agent if the symptoms resolve, then that's the diagnosis. There'll be other clues if there's presence of Akathisia, tardive symptoms, or orofacial dyskinesia, then that's a point in favor of the drug induced movement disorder. And SPECT scan will be normal, be, be it death scan or PET scans, or cardiac MIBG scintigraphy will be normal. So the treatment is first of all, don't use the drug if avoidable, stop the drug if you're suspecting it. And Symptomatic therapy if the symptoms are limiting with L-DOPA and benzodiazepine. Let's move on now to toxin-induced Parkinsonism. That's actually a problem we have encountered classically with the MPTP model, and I'll show you some MPTP classical um, um, classical videos. Carbon monoxide poisoning, manganese. I've got some manganese miners videos there. Mercury poisoning, carbon disulfide, methanol, ethanol can also produce, they say. So here is somebody with pesticides presenting this with... individual developed fairly acute Parkinsonism following ingestion of a large quantity of pesticides of uncertain type. There is marked facial masking. With reduced facial expression. Increased blink frequency. 
has a dystonic posture in his left upper extremity. As well as some dystonia in the right hand. With his arms extended, the dystonic posture is evident in both hands, somewhat asymmetric, more severe on the left side. His rapid open-close hand movements are slow and very limited in excursion on the left, whereas they were not as involved on the right side. Rotational movements of the right wrist are mildly impaired. He's not able to carry these out on the left. He's able to get up from a chair with his arms crossed, and gait is brisk. Right arm swing is possibly mildly reduced, but close to normal while there is no arm swing on the left uh, and more dystonic upper extremity. Right. So that was toxin-induced Parkinsonism that you just saw. This was the MPTP video I was hoping to show you. These patients had, as part of the drug addiction, MPTP. This is without the, any levodopa before the patient is treated. You can see how Parkinsonian and rigid as a consequence of MPTP toxic exposure. I'm going to touch you right here. A phenomena which we see with the first generation antipsychotics in psychiatry in patients rarely these days. Significant uncle rigidity. Patients holding the posture, and perhaps you can see the lead pipe. Perhaps you can do the detector on camera. Or do this as fast as you can. He's right handed. That was fine. Now with this hand. Really kinetic, severely. Profoundly slow, profoundly slow. He was being asked to arise. Now you see the examiner helping him. And are those Parkinsonian signs, level of tap, reflex. Keeps blinking. Stick out your tongue. See the mask faces, facial hypomania. Very slow in taking instructions. Can you stick it out any further than that? Can you raise this hand up at all? Can you raise that hand Let's up? move the video forward to show I'm you what he's like when he has had the treatment. Uh, yeah, so this same patient you just saw after treatment with yeah. levodopa. Is that uncomfortable? Is that painful? Or was it just 
I just couldn't move. What did that feel like? It wasn't painful. Mm-hmm. Physically. Mm-hmm. It was painful mentally. It was difficult mentally. Yes. Is that because you basically lost control, or was there fear, or what, what types of things were bothering you? I don't think it was lost control because it was fear. You know, I almost suffocated. Okay. You make it. That's just a good level of weight effect. Then move around. He wasn't able to. He walked. Watch him walking now. <clears throat> Jumps out of his chair. Come on back in. Walks. Comes back. Good level of a response. And this is some time afterwards. Six years. Right. Let's move and see the next slide. Right, the next condition I want to talk to you about is the normal pressure hydrocephalus. Now, it's the classical triad of gait disorder, cognitive decline, and urinary incontinence. It's treatable with a shunt, as long as we have selected the patient correctly on the basis of neurological abnormalities and the CSF tap test, that's still the best option here. Shunt surgery is uh, the only established solution for this one. Here we'll see in the MRI coming up of enlarged ventricles disproportionate to the degree of cortical atrophy and a normal opening pressure on LP. It's to the impaired absorption of CSF in the arachnoid granulations and can happen after meningitis or subarachnoid hemorrhage. The exact epidemiology of normal pressure hydrocephalus is not worked out. Although considered to be rare, the impression is that it's possibly more common than we think. The symptomatology arises from a disturbance of the white matter pathway subserving frontal lobe function. And hence we get the gait disorders and the higher mental function disturbances. We do not get the mask faces and the other features. So a possible differentiation would be with the vascular Parkinsonism that you saw earlier on. The cognition is said to be through the stretching of the frontal white fibers. And that doesn't improve very much from the shunting procedures. There, of course, might be other comorbidities. A little bit of a challenge is worthwhile, although unlikely to work. We mustn't overdiagnose normal pressure hydrocephalus, as I've seen happen everywhere, because it's expensive and there are complications of shunting, besides the patient is not getting the right treatment. Here we have some videos to look at. So let's start with this one. This is the classic walking of the patient prior to shunt surgery. You see him rise and watch the way he walks. His feet are glued to the floor. He hardly takes them off and then he stops. And he has difficulty in starting off once again. A magnetic gait. Some sort of an apraxia in being able to walk is the feature. He's stuck to the floor. Again, he starts off short shuffling steps. Doesn't move much. Unable to generate the stride. Watch the feet as it tries to lift off from the ground. He stores as well. So that's that. Now watch this one instead now. This 
practice before and after the operation. Before the operation, that's the way he walks. And now you will see after the operation, shut. Remarkable difference. Right. So yeah, so we just saw the effects of surgery and how, how, how meaningful it can be. These were the scans, basically, this is the close-up view of the scan. So can you watch the fluid actually going out into that area? And you can see it here as well. And that's the shunt in place. And over you can see the large size of the ventricles, transependymal fluid leak in normal pressure hydrocephalus. And this patient was completely cured, uh, contributed by Peter Hedera. And again, this is another hydrocephalus, both on CT scan as well as on MRI. Normal pressure hydrocephalus, you can see the transependymal sort of uh, exudation of the fluid. And uh, let's see Dr. Gomez Hassan. Moving on to the next feature, which is chronic traumatic encephalopathy, CTE, punch drunk dementia probabilistica. We have classically seen that in patients who have been boxers, I'll be showing you. Uh, Muhammad Ali's uh, clips in a minute, but it often happens to people who play contact sports and who suffer regular concussion injuries, footballers who head the football. But it's also been found in military personnel, and we Indian Army have a large number of individuals who are being exposed to the shell shocks. And in Australian Army, research has been done in regards to development of these extraperineal syndromes in possibly some predisposed individuals. Besides, we must have proper boxing association, Indian Boxing Association guidelines, and in other contacts called Indian Football Association of people who get concussed during football or other contact sports being checked out before they suffer more injuries, particularly in professional footballers and professional boxers, it's our duty as doctors to look after them and to counsel them. This is actually fully up and running in America and Canada and in some parts of Europe. So imaging is important. At a young age of chronic traumatic encephalopathy, there can be some of these psychiatric features. And I'll show you some of Muhammad Ali's talk where some changes might have been noticed very early on. It's said to be a tauopathy, and there are some risk factors for dementia with head injury. Now, here is our great Muhammad Ali, previously known as Cassius Clay. Right, we now pay our homage to the great Muhammad Ali. This is Ali. very early in his career. The world heavyweight champion should be pretty like me. Watch his movements. I'm as pretty as you and you're not a fighter. <laughs> oh, you got me beat. There's no problem there. The round is round eight. If, the, if that's what you're talking about, I have predicted round eight. To prove Watch his good. movements, right, his facial expression. I get him like more. <laughs> his sense of humor. Oh, that's pretty wild. It's good to see you looking really great. I'm glad to be here. You this are. Is I'm getting old now. Later. Do you feel old? Yeah, I feel like I'm about, about 73 your age. Do you? No. I feel pretty good. You do. I tell you why I said it's, it's good to see you looking good, because, as you know, there's been a lot of speculation about your condition after the Holmes fight, particularly in this country. There was a suggestion, for instance, that there was brain damage. Well, I tell you what. <laughs> uh, your brain control what comes out of your mouth. During this interview, you check me out. 
And now, so you tell me about the brain damage. I'll let you know at the end of the interview, shall I? I went to a place called Mayo Clinic. It's the Facial world's expression. best clinic. And there were reports right. about me of brain trouble, kidney trouble, and speech defects. So I went to Mayo Clinic and got a physical. I stayed there for about two days. And we uh, 100% check out. So all of these local doctors and one horse town doctors can pack up because I got okay from the best clinic in the world. You hope not? Further down it the line. It has affected your movement. It has affected your speech. It has affected your facial expression. But it has not <laughs> affected your mental capacity. Does it bother you when you hear people say, as they do, Muhammad Ali's punch drunk? He's severely affected now. Does it bother you when people say, no. you know, you should have gotten out earlier, you're no. sick as no. a result of the punches? Severely affected. You wouldn't come on here? No. When you look at the old pictures of the fast talking, fast moving. You show me a picture of me. You show me a picture of Clearly. And we look much younger than bang, bang, bang. Does your present condition upset you? Does it bother you? Uh, only a trial, trial for my law. God tries in wealth, tries in pain, tries in failure, whatever. Anyway, let's move on from there. Um,